Hey guys, welcome back to day two of my Aquaria review. Now I've decided that instead of going over every single card as I did last time, I'm only going to go over a smaller subset of cards, allowing me to go into more depth with ones I find particularly notable. I wasn't even really going into limited where most of that stuff would come up. If I miss any card that you personally like, or if you think there's something that I should touch on, I can definitely come back and review it at a later point. Just leave a comment or message me and I will have a look into it. So the first card that I'm going to go into is Bastion of Remembrance. As someone who's played through a lot of different formats, I really have to say that this is not a card to be underestimated. It's a 3 mana enchantment that when it comes into play makes a 1-1. One, one. Whenever a creature control dies, you drain the opponent for 1, so it doesn't look very exciting. But the second ability here is deceptively powerful. In the past, cards like Zulaport Cutthroat have been um, format defining because people didn't take into account the value in stacking up lots of incremental value from sacrificing cheap permanence and the ease at which you can return them in some cases. The number one thing that I want to combo with this is the classic cat and oven combo. The way that combo works is when you play the cat, you drain the opponent for one. When you sacrifice it to the oven, you get a food and then you use the food to return the cat. So you're draining the opponent for one every turn. But if you draw a bastion, you play a bastion, it doubles the speed, you drain for two, or if you have two ovens, you drain for four. These decks are usually referred to as aristocrat decks. There's a bunch of cards that I will continue to show you that could go into a deck like that, but overall I'm going to save that for a different video. Needless to say, I'm really excited about that as being a potential archetype. Alright, so the next card I want to talk about is Call of the Death Dweller. Although I think it could be good in the previously mentioned aristocrat deck, I'm going to try to avoid that for the time being. Getting to return two creatures can be pretty good depending on what you're returning, but I really think the power is being able to give one of them Death Touch. We already had the card Gruesome Menagerie be a deck in the past, so I wouldn't recommend this card if all you want is value from returning creatures to play. We want to focus on the Death Touch part of it, so we need to look at what creatures we can return to play that are able to make use of that. The options that I'm most closely looking at are cards like Footlight Fiend and Dreadhorde Butcher, ones that have damage when they die. If you give either of these cards Death Touch, they'll first obviously kill any creature they damage in combat, whether they're attacking or blocking, but then they'll ping something else, you know, getting a two for one. Dreadhorde Butcher gets a special mention, as it grows over time, so the opponent will want, they'll want to kill it, they'll want to block it, making it a great uh, use for the Menace counter as well. The other cards I'm looking at are Mayhem Devil and Judas Scourge Diva. Now, both of these are three mana, so you wouldn't be able to return anything else when you brought it back, unless you have any zero-cost creatures to bring back. But giving either of these Death Touch would allow you to really clear your opponent's board. Like, imagine a Mayhem Devil with Death Touch, and then you also have Cold and Familiar and Oven going. You'd be able to ping two things a turn or more. Anyway, you get the idea. Before we move on, I just want to talk about something outside of Standard. I'm going to give an honourable mention to Goblin and Chain Whirler. It's honestly pretty rude to even think about returning a Chain Whirler with Death Touch, which makes me even more willing to do it. Next up we have Chevil, Bane of Monsters. It's quite the wordy card, but I'll simplify it. It's a 2-mana 1-3 with Death Touch. At the beginning of your upkeep, you put a counter on something. When it dies, you gain 3 and you draw a card. Its ability affects not only creatures, but also planeswalkers. It only has one power though, so I don't think it's going to be much of a threat to many of them. I think that's notable, because a card like Teferi comes into play, minuses, and when it minuses, it goes to one loyalty. So it's good at stopping things like that. The downside is Cheville needs to be in play for you to draw the card. So it's a little bit vulnerable. If they remove it, then you're not going to get any value out of it. I think it'll probably see play in creature light decks with lots of removal. You play Cheville, and then as soon as you put a counter on something, you immediately just murderous ride of that permanent, and then you get to draw a card, gain three. Alternatively, it could be good against a red deck, because it has that three life tacked on whenever you kill one of their small creatures or block in combat, you can gain some life back. Yeah, definitely has potential, but definitely not a big game changer. All right, before anyone's up in arms and I'm suggesting that this card could be played in Constructed, I just want to say that it definitely has potential specifically in the Fires of Invention decks. It's a 6 mana draw 4 that you can cycle. The ability to cycle it gives it a ton of flexibility compared to the better draw spells such as Drawn from Dreams. 
Notably, once you get fires into play, you can only play two spells a turn. When you cycle boon, it doesn't count as a spell, so it gets additional value. It's obviously a lot worse than Drawn from Dreams in finding your fires of invention. So I'm not going to go into more detail than that. I just think that it could have potential and is definitely something that you might want to try. All right, next up we'll have a look at some of the new Mythos cards. They're all spells that have a bonus effect if you pay three colors instead of only one. Note that you don't have to pay more mana. The extra colors just have to be spent while you cast it. For instance, Mythos of Snapdax. Each player chooses a non-land permanent they control for each type and sacrifice the rest. Essentially this means you only get to keep one artifact, one creature, etc. If you pay red-black as part of the cost, and I'm going to assume that you are paying the extra cost, it is the same effect that Tragic Arrogance had a few years ago, um, which means that you get to choose for each player. Tragic Arrogance was a great card back then, but it was a different meta. Often players would have a single Thopter token they could choose, and you could force them to sacrifice the rest of their artifacts and creatures. There were some, you know, not very exciting Planeswalkers as well, um, I think it could be a really great cyborg card to bring in against the decks have a lot of permanents with varied power level. For instance, if you face a deck, like a ramp deck, with a bunch of big creatures and they have a singular arboreal grazer, yeah, you know, it, it'll be great in that kind of circumstance. If they're playing a deck where their only creature is going to be a big one, their only planeswalker is going to be a big one, then it doesn't do anything. Sadly, due to a change in wording, you can't choose a land creature as the creature, as you could have done with Tragic Arrogance, so it's not going to be a counter to Nyssa. The second Mythos card we'll look at is Mythos of Nephroi. I'd recommend not reading the card if you enjoy your sanity. It essentially says that if you pay three mana, you get to kill a creature, but if you pay all three colors, you can destroy any non-land permanent instead. I feel like they got their first version that worked... The, the first version that worked within the rules... And they're like, yep, done. Ship it. That's the version we're going to use. Um, overall, it's really pushed. Like, this is much better than we normally see out of removal spells. The downside is that, obviously, you can't play it in a deck that's not Abzan Colors. Abzan decks having access to this is great. Because it can not only kill a creature in creature matchups, but it can kill a Planeswalker in th those kind of matchups. It can kill a Fires of Invention. A removal spell like this that's also good against control is a really key part to a small creature-based deck being able to fight against control decks. I expect the existence of this card to be enough to push an Abzan mid-range deck into the meta. Maybe not, maybe not tier 1. I'm not going to go on again about Aristocrats, but this is the perfect kind of removal spell for that kind of deck. A nice catch-all that can get anything. As an aside, on the topic of this card being hard to pass, it really reminds me of an old card called Dead Ringers. Who can legitimately read this card only once or twice and then tell me exactly what creatures that it destroys? Mythos of Brokos is the last one that I'll be talking about today. The red one is pretty unexciting and the blue one hasn't been spoiled yet, but this one, this one excites me. It may not end up being any good in constructed play, to be honest, but there's just so much value. There is so much value. Four mana returning two permanents from your graveyard to your hand is nice. But if you combine it with Mystic Sanctuary, you can pay four mana, search for Mystic Sanctuary, return it and another permanent, then replay the Sanctuary, putting the Mythos on top of your deck and repeating that every turn. Doing this loop requires you to have three islands, which can be pretty tricky when you also have to make green and black mana. But, I mean, you have Watery Grave and Breeding Pool, and this kind of strategy normally happens late in the game anyway, so I think it'll be reasonable. It's a little reminiscent of a deck from a few years ago that I think Channel Fireball played, um, called Season Past. Use Dark Petition to search for Season Past, and then Seasons Past to uh, get back Dark Petition. Same thing here with Mystic Sanctuary and the, this spell. So a less exciting way that you could use it is you could use it to search for Uro. Uro is busted, we get it, you could search for Uro. You can make it spicy, you could search for Uro and also use Lazav to copy it. But fundamentally, that's a Lazav thing. That's not a really a, a Mythos thing. The real thing is trying to figure out whether or not you'll have time to do this kind of strategy. And I'm hoping the answer is yes. There's a decent, there's a decent chance it's no, but it doesn't mean I'm not going to try it. The next card up is Dranath Magistrate. A nice little hate bear, well, technically not a bear, that will do massive things. Just maybe not in standard. He stops adventure spells, he stops escape cards like Uro, and a few cast from exile cards like Light Up the Stage and Escape the Wilds. 
His main strength is going to be in older formats, where there's a massive list of cards and decks that he stops, like Cascade, Flashback. I think he stops Madness as well. There's going to be lots of stuff. Like, for instance, if you're an Underworld Breach player, you're probably going to face this guy in the future. Okay, so I don't normally play blue-red, especially not a blue-red spell-based tempo deck. But this card makes me really excited. For now, I want you to ignore the first ability completely. Assume that she's going to be like a 3-3 or like a 4-3. All you need to do to make this card completely absurd is look for cards that let you discard cards for free, discard a lot of them cheaply, or lastly, cards that force both players to discard because you can disrupt your opponent without disrupting yourself. Now, of these examples, not all of them are standard legal. So the first one, which I don't think is, you know, just getting it out there, Awaken the Erstwild. You can force your opponent to discard their hand and make some zombies. You discard your hand, you get some zombies, but you also get to draw a bunch. Nice, value. Okay, maybe not that one. But cards like Ox of Agonis or Channeled Force, which is also a new card, they force you to discard your hand to draw, and then using her, you know, second ability, you draw that many again. Outside of Standard, two cards stand out to me initially. The first is Street Wraith, which lets you cast Pot of Greed. What does Pot of Greed do, you ask? I play the magic card Pot of Greed. It allows me to draw two cards from my deck. The other big one is Burning Inquiry. If you use Burning Inquiry, you'll draw three, then discard three, but then draw another three. So not only are you getting an Ancestral Recall, but you're also filling the graveyard, which will make her power grow and grow and grow. Even if the worst case is you put her in your deck, and your deck has a bunch of cycling cards, and each time you cycle, you draw one extra card, I could definitely see her working well. Another card she could work with is the one that should be on the screen now. Has cycling, so obviously works well with her, but can also give her haste and trample. I can definitely see her coming down as a 12 power haste trample and just winning the game on the spot. Alright, it's time for lightning round, version 2. Each card will just get a brief note from me to round out the rest of the video. Uh, this would be good if Aurora didn't already del away all of your creatures. It'd be good to get Aurora, I guess. Hmm, human support. I wonder if this could go in aristocrats. Hmm, human support. I wonder if this could go in aristocrats. Hmm, human support. I wonder if this could go in aristocrats. Between this, Growth Spiral, Beanstalk Giant, Wolf Willow Haven, we probably could see a big mana deck in standard. I do like those kind of decks. So, talking flavor here, if I choose Hexproof, the flavor is it's on the ground and you can't hit its weak point. But if it gets flying later on, then it isn't vulnerable again. Big flavor fail. This Otter is the cutest villain in MTG lore, confirmed. This is an amazing card that would be way better if it was a bear and it'd be way better if you could mutate onto it. This card would probably be great if Teferi didn't exist. The last card I'm excited about is Shark Tornado. Although the flavor is a bit over the top for me in terms of the card's effect, I'm really excited to jam a giant shark into play at instant speed, which is also uncounterable, has flying, draws you a card, and because cycling isn't a spell, you can do it on your opponent's end step despite them having a Teferi out. I don't know much more to say, other than I'm really excited to try it out both in control decks, but also in ramp decks as well that can make use of a large amount of mana to make a giant shark. Alright, that's it for me for now. I've had a look through all the spoilers currently from the set, and these are the ones that intrigued me. If you think that I've missed anything, let me know and I'll have a look. I'll start making deck lists once we have some more of the set. I'm not up to that point yet, but if there's a deck list that you want me to have a look at, feel free to send it through. Other than that, I will catch you probably in a few days' time when there are some more spoilers to look at. Peace.